Welcome to lecture 7 of the course Philosophy of Science for Psychologists. This lecture is about Paul Feyerabend and Eva Klaktosch. The logical positivists argue that science is the only source of knowledge. Later, Popper agreed with them, but the logical positivists and also Popper, they were unable to find a demarcation criterion to make this distinction between science and pseudoscience. Last lecture we saw that Kuhn gave up on that project. Thomas Kuhn says, well, I'm not trying to find a demarcation criterion, I'm just going to describe what science is and how science works and how it changes over time. But we did see that he finds a demarcation criterion, having a paradigm. The first thing we'll discuss today is Paul Feyerabend's epistemology. He is, just like Kuhn, a constructivist and a relativist. And after that, we'll discuss the problems with relativism and constructivism. Then we'll take a look at Lakatos' sophisticated falsificationism. He responds both to the falsificationism of um, Popper and also to the constructivism and relativism of uh, Kuhn and of his friend uh, Paul Feyerabend. Then we'll see in the end what uh, Kuhn said about Lakatos' ideas and how they compared to his. And then we can draw a conclusion. I think today's conclusion will be that with Lakatos we now have an option to actually distinguish science from pseudoscience. And then the question is, what's there to do for next lecture? Last time we looked at the influential constructivist and relativist Thomas Kuhn. Today we look at the even more consequent, you might argue, constructivist and relativist, and that's Paul Feyerabend. Feyerabend wrote about his good friend Lagatosch. Uh, he says, well, uh, at a party in the 1970s, in 1970, one of the best friends I ever had called me at a party and he said, Paul, you have such strange ideas. Why don't you write them down? I shall write a reply, we'll publish the whole thing, and I promise you, we shall have lots of fun. Well, unfortunately, Lakatos died before he could do that. We can look at his philosophy of science later, uh, because he did write uh, about that. But he didn't give a response to the strange ideas of Paul Feyerabend. And, well, let's look at those first and then see how Lakatos probably would have responded. Uh, to those strange ideas and I do believe that Feyerabend uh, has some strange ideas so I, I do believe that you will think that uh, so let's take a look at that he is a relativist and a constructivist so he has been influenced by Kuhn and also by uh, Wittgenstein so we're Kuhn used paradigms because he didn't want to use the phrase language games. Feyerabend does something similar. He says, well, I'm not going to talk about paradigms, but I'm going to talk about traditions. And we'll see that traditions are broader than paradigms. Paradigms are about science. Traditions are more broad than just science. So it looks more akin to uh, uh, language games, you could argue. Okay, so we saw that paradigms, according to Kuhn, we, when you have a paradigm shift, the new paradigm, we might intuitively, intuitively think that it is an improvement, but it isn't, according to Kuhn. And Feyerabend makes, similar, makes a similar claim about the traditions. In the history of science, traditions follow each other, just like paradigms. 
but one is not better than the other. And a current Western science, I don't know why people don't always call it Western science, it's just science, I think, but he says, well, Western science is one of the many traditions we have as human beings, and we can choose our own tradition. So Kuhn says, well, what we all have, if you're a scientist, you, you work within a paradigm. We all have accepted that paradigm with maybe some people from an old paradigm still working at the Department of Philosophy, uh, being angry that their paradigm is not the current paradigm. Uh, but Kuhn says, well, there is just one paradigm that's accepted by science. Then we have a period of normal science and you can't switch back. So he compares it to a Gestalt switch to make clear that if you go from one paradigm to another, it's a complete renewal of the field. It's a complete new interpretation of your sensory input, might, one might argue. So, and you can't turn back. So in that sense, it looks more like a religious conversion. If you convert it from one religion to the other, to the other, then it's not that you'll go back to your old religion uh, next day or become an atheist the following. So um, paradigms are something you stick to uh, and you can't just change them. Fire Amund says, well, you can just choose different paradigms in, in the terminology of Kuhn and you can choose different traditions in his terminology. So there's, there's a big difference. Firearm summarizes his own epistemology. We'll see in a moment why I use epistemology and not philosophy of science in two slogans. One is against method and the other is anything else. So first look at against method. Even as one of his books is called against method and it's about a scientific method. So at first sight, you might think that he is against the scientific method and he is not. He is basically pro-science, he's a big fan of science, uh, he's interested in that and he, do, he does agree that it is indeed a method to acquire knowledge. So what is he against and why? So let, let me start with the why. So it seems a little odd but I think uh, it makes sense in a moment because he is a relativist and a constructivist. So what his what is his main argument? Well, the same as we saw with Kuhn. The argument is that the observation is radically theory laden. If you look at something, if you observe something, you need a theory in order to be able to observe something at all. Otherwise, it's just chaos. So you need this observation theory, this background theory, this theory you, you're even not aware of, uh, but that enables you to see things. And we do believe, of course, that we see things. We do, we do believe that we see a cup. Uh, but if the theory, if, if um, the observation is radically theory laden, you also need a theory to observe a cup, for instance. And if you have a different theory, that would imply that you see something different. And that means that we can never know the objective facts. We never observe the way the world actually is, or at least we cannot know that. We need a theory to construct the facts. So that is also what Feyerabend says, and he's very clear about that. On closer analysis, we even find that science knows no bare facts. There are no objective facts. Science knows no objective facts. And that all the facts, because science, of course, claims to discover the objective facts, and the word fact usually is used to refer to that, the things or the, those things in the world we, we, we believe to be objective facts, but fire up to put them between quotation marks because those facts do not exist, or at least we don't know them. So that means that all the facts that enter our knowledge, everything we know about the world, we know about the facts, is already viewed in a certain way. That is, they are essentially ideational. They they depend on our ideas, on our theories, our observation theories. So what we think the facts are, are basically constructed by our, by our own ideas. So they are constructed, they are subjective facts, there are no objective facts. So this is 
where it all boils down to, and we'll, we will return to that also when we evaluate constructivism and relativism, it all comes down to this argument. We have input, and in order to observe an object, to observe a rabbit or a, a duck, we need a theory. And then we see the rabbit and we see the duck. It's not that we see something as something else. That's not what they're claiming. It's not what just Rolf, we saw that uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the explanation of the theory relatedness of observation. It's not what just Rolf said. The psychologist who said, well, you can walk through a, a dark forest and see the white bark uh, of a, um, a tree and you can, you can interpret that as a ghost, but it isn't the ghost. You're actually then seeing something as something else. And if you see the bark as the bark, then you're seeing it the way it is. So if you have a theory that makes you observe the bark as a ghost, you're doing something wrong. And then this argument is being used by Kuhn and uh, Lakatos, and it's also found, you, you also find, find it in, in Wittgenstein already. So Wittgenstein already is talking about the duck and the rabbit and about Jastrof, he explicitly refers to that. That in Kuhn and in uh, Firearm, you see that they say, well, you're not seeing something as something else. You see the duck, if you have this picture, or you see the rabbit, or you see the ghost. Okay. So there are no objective facts that we can know. So you can't say that someone is wrong if he says, I, th that's a duck. And you can't say that someone is wrong when he says, I see a ghost. And in Kuhn, this all pertains to sign, the description of science and the development of science. And he made it so he, he made it really easy for himself. He was just saying things about science. And when he was talking about science, he was talking about physics and astronomy. Well, that's also easy because we, we will agree that that is science. And fire I think, is a more honest constructivist and relativist. If you, if you accept this, then this has huge implications. And I think Lakatos is right. There's a strange ideas, but, but they are interesting ideas. So, so let's look at that. Let's look at what, what he is, uh, is uh, telling us. So the one implication, uh, one major implication, is that, and now we're going, going to uh, what he is against, is that you should not accept the monopoly of the scientific method to acquire knowledge. So science does have this monopoly on knowledge acquisition. And Feyerabend says, well, if there was a way to have access to objective facts, then we should use our best method and then scientists claim that the scientific method is the best and if that's the case then we should use that and it would be justified that science is the only method we use to acquire knowledge if knowledge is about the objective facts but we do not have such access and the argument of the theory layers of observation is the central argument is the key argument here and that means that if it depends on the theory you use, what the facts are, the constructive facts, the subjective facts, then why just use this one method? You must also accept other methods as sources of knowledge, because knowledge is always knowledge about the facts that are created using a certain theory. It is possible to just use the scientific method and that method has all kinds of rules. You have the methods, how you do research, and it's also successful to some extent, he says. That means it's successful in predicting um, the way the world is going to be. It has hypothesis predictions, and the predictions are not falsified, but supported by empirical evidence. They are, they are successful. Well, to some extent might be an understatement here, I think. Uh, but, well, given, uh, given uh, what he's trying to argue, uh, we can understand he, he uses, uh, he, he downplays the success of science. 
He says, but is it des desirable to support such a tradition to the exclusion of something else, to everything else? You exclude all the other methods. Should we transfer it uh, to it the civil rights for dealing with knowledge? And then he says, no, 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 no. We should not only use science as the, a, the method of gaining knowledge. You should also allow for other methods. And then he says, anything goes, any method goes. You're allowed to use any method you see fit to generate knowledge. So he wants what he calls methodological anarchism. Not just one method, any method goes. Not just the one, the one scientific method, not just one other method either. So. And he's really radical here. He says, you can use voodoo, you can use magic as a method to gain knowledge about the world. And he, he, he uses voodoo. That's, that's an example he gives in his book. It's not that I say, well, if you're radical, you should also make this claim about voodoo. No, he makes this claim about voodoo. So let's be sure. He is, if he says, uh, I defend a methodological anarchism, it's an epistemological anarchism, not a political anarchism. He's a radical democrat in politics, in society. So he is only an anarchist in epistemology. He's not for anarchy in uh, the US. For instance, he was working in the US when he wrote this. Uh, so, now, I hope it becomes clear why I'm talking about his epistemology and not his philosophy of science, because we're back at the questions about knowledge. So we started way back in our first lecture by thinking about knowledge. When we talked about Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, we were not talking about science. Science as a source of knowledge, we were talking, well, what could be the source of knowledge? Your ratio, uh, your experiences you have when you observe the world. Could we have knowledge at all? And then later, and it became very apparent with the logical positivist and, and, and Popper, we were talking about, well, what is science? Because if we are in agreement that science is the source of knowledge, then it becomes important to distinguish science from pseudoscience, because you don't want pseudoscientific disciplines in science, because you want to understand society, you want to understand the world, you want to understand human beings, you want to understand all behavior of human beings uh, as a psychologist and then you don't want a method in your endeavor to find out the facts about the human psyche if that method does not provide you with actual knowledge but with nonsense or with false claims so you want to get rid of pseudoscience you don't and, and that's why uh, and I hope that in the end of this lecture, it, it's, it's clear that it is uh, indeed uh, uh, justified. That's why you don't have astrology for psychology, uh, for, for psychologists in your, uh, in your program at a university. But if you're a constructivist and a relativist, and you say all observation is relatively theory laden, like Kuhn did and Feyerabend did, then Feyerabend is, I think, um, the most honest uh, cons uh, uh, constructivist and relativist. Because then you should allow for any method, and then the difference between science and pseudoscience is an artificial difference. Who cares? You can still think about this. You can still think about the difference between a scientific method and an unscientific method, but both methods uh, are allowed, or you should use, if you want to find out all the facts about the world. So not only science is a source of knowledge, voodoo is one too. Astrology is one too. And so it doesn't matter if astrology is a science or not. So you can use astrology, you can use voodoo to find out uh, things about the human mind, for instance, and, and about mental disorders. Not only science is a method to find out about mental disorders. So all thoughts are fruitful. 
So, and then of course, we're not thinking about the difference between science and pseudoscience, we're just doing epistemology. We're saying, well, what's the source of knowledge? Well, it could be science, it could be voodoo, it could be astrology, it could be your gut feeling. Well, it could be any method, hence methodological anarchy, epistemological anarchy. And you have to be an anarchist, Firehound argued. He says, if you want to understand the world, then it's strange to impose restrictions, purely seen from the epistemological point of view. If you want to gain all knowledge about the world, and you have different methods to gain knowledge about the constructed facts, then, well, why use just one method? Because that method might not construct several facts that another method constructs, another theory constructs. And thus you risk missing things. And then he says, well, every methodology has its merits and they all have their flaws. So you are allowed to use science. It's not that he is against method, against the scientific method. He's not saying you shouldn't use the scientific method. He says he shouldn't use only the scientific method. You should also use or be allowed to use voodoo as a method to gain knowledge about the human psyche. You should also use or be allowed to use astrology to find out about the human mind. And if there were only objective facts, then you use a method that's best suited for that. But there are no objective facts, or at least we cannot know them. So each method has its positive side. Each method has theories in it that generate certain facts and other theories might not do that. So there's a second and related reason why you should be an epistemological anarchist and that is if you're dogmatic about any method, so it's not about the scientific method, it's, it's about being a dogmatic uh, with respect to any method you think is the only method we should be allowed to use uh, to, to gain knowledge, so it could also be a religious method. So if you want to know what the world is like, look it up in the Bible. That would also be dogmatic. Uh, would also be dogmatically pushing one method that goes against a humanitarian attitude. And we can understand why he says that because he is working in California uh, when he writes his book, and that's also the time that the Native Americans are finally allowed to go to universities and then in that in, in, in the case of um, uh, fire armor those were uh, the navajo and they believe in things like making rain by dancing they have all kinds of beliefs they have they have this method of making predictions about the world if you dance long enough uh, in such and such a way it will rain uh, for instance and then they get to the university and they're all being told that it's all a bunch of nonsense you, used to use, you have to use the scientific method to gain knowledge about, well, anything, about the weather, for instance. And then, apparently, they're not free to think whatever they want. So, they're still being uh, discriminated against. And firearms was for a radical freedom, a radical democracy. So you can understand where this comes from. He has noble, noble ideas of uh, humans and human beings and let them, let them be free and let everyone be free in their thoughts. So you have to be free to think whatever they want. So, so here is a reason I think why uh, at least uh, some of you will, might, uh, will, will, will find these ideas of uh, uh, fire and uh, attractive. And there is, there is, uh, this, uh, this, this noble motivation for defending this epistemological uh, anarchy. So uh, we can understand where it comes from and we will evaluate it later. So let's look at the consequences. And when we look at the consequences, we are already going into the direction of uh, evaluating it. So, so because the consequences are so counterintuitive and so strange that specifying the consequence <laughs> Uh, already seems to amount to saying, oh, something is wrong here. So let's look at the consequences. And Fire Island uh, himself is uh, uh, pointing out these consequences, right? So it's not something that uh, others or 
have uh, have said that those were the consequences of that I am or that I am making these claims. It's Fire Abend that says these are the consequences of this radical constructivism and relativism. This is a consequence of methodological and epistemological anarchy. The first consequence is that knowledge is a sea of alternatives, and the second is that there should be freedom of methodology in education at the university, for instance. So let's look at the first Knowledge is a sea of alternatives. If you use a method, then you have a theories and uh, assumptions and methods you use. You have rules you have to stick to uh, because of your method or and all of what's already been discovered about the objective facts. And of course, that's an assumption. There are no objective facts according to, or at least we cannot know them according to Fire Island. But of course, that is what people believe when they are using uh, the methods and the discoveries, the theories of a um, uh, tradition. So you use rules. And he says, if you want really want to get to know everything, you should use rules that go against the rules of the methods in your tradition go against the already discovered claims about the world you should use anti-rules so if you're working within an empiricist paradigm or tradition uh, uh, as fire Adam would, would call it uh, then the rule is a theory must correspond to the experience because the experience is the source of knowledge the anti-rule then is well the theory doesn't have to correspond to the experience so you go against it. So no, it's not necessary. Um, so in terms of Kuhn, again, it's accepting an other and even incommensurable paradigm. And you can choose that. So here's a difference with respect to Kuhn. But it is something related to that. Another example, the, the Neo-Darwinian theory of evolution by natural selection says uh, that uh, in order for the species to have originated, uh, to uh, they, 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 the earth has to be really, really old. And modern scientific uh, estimates are that it's about 4.7 billion years old. And that would allow for evolution by natural selection, as it's described by contemporary biology. Creationists... Christians that look into the Bible as their method to establish how old the earth is say, well, if you calculate uh, based on the events uh, happening after the creation uh, of uh, earth by God, uh, how old all the peoples or the generations or all the people described in the Bible are and the events in the Bible, then you can calculate and you go back and then you see earth is 6,000 years old. So using that method and the theories of that method, you'll get to the knowledge of the constructed fact that Earth is 6,000 years old, just like when you use a scientific method and the theory is there, you'll get to the constructed fact, you get to the knowledge of the constructed fact that Earth is 4.7 billion years old. And there you'll see, yeah, it's both knowledge and it's incompatible. It's like a contradiction, it's, 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 it can't be both right. And you can only claim that, can't be both right, if there would be some objective fact, if we could know that. But since we cannot know that, you can't say who's right or wrong. It's both knowledge, depending on the tradition you're in. It's relative to the tradition. And if you are allowed to use all the traditions ever, then this all is knowledge. It's a sea of incompatible alternatives. And this is actually what, what Fire Island is claiming. This phrase is coming from him, the sea of incompatible alternatives. That's what he says. So, and now you'll see that, okay, this is the radical consequence, but also seems to boil down to some criticism, right? Because, well, you can't believe both. And another point is, the consequence is that we have here something that's in support of the claims made by the people of the Trump administration. I think many people, especially in Europe uh, and in the, uh, the democratic camp, camp and in, uh, uh, in science, would say 
the Trump administration makes all kinds of false claims. They are flat out liars. They are. But, so if even, even they lie about the stupidest things. Apparently, Trump hates Obama. Obama is just more liked than Trump. Face it, that's a fact. Deal with it. No, he doesn't deal with it. And then he says, at my uh, address, when I became president, there were more people present than when Obama had his address. It's a clearly false statement. Compare the, compare the videos, compare the, um, uh, the pictures. It's false. It's a lie. And what does one of his spokespersons say a couple of days later, Kellyanne Conway? She says, oh, well, you have your facts and we're just presenting alternative facts. Okay. Yeah. So there are alternative facts. So there were more people present at Trump's address. Oh, so lucky, lucky you, lucky you, President Trump. You are more liked than Obama. Okay. In Fire Island, it's both true, right? If you accept Fire Island's epistemology, then there are really are alternative facts and you can believe whatever you want. It's both true that Trump is a better and more like president than Obama and that Obama is a better and more liked president than Trump. Trump is not a liar. He's not ignorant. He's not a bullshitter out for money, personal gain and uh, uh, power. He's not a racist. He's not a sexist. He's done really well with the COVID crisis. Sure, he's done more positive things than any person ever alive for uh, the Black Lives Movement. Yes, that's all true. It's all knowledge. I know that this is true. It corresponds to the fact, as long as you are allowed to use any method. So here you see the consequence boils down in lead to criticism, because are we really going to say this? Let's look at another example. Let's look at the question, what causes an aut autism spectrum disorder? So you could already argue that the move from DSM-4, where there were four categories that in DSM-5 now are classified as uh, different stages, different phases, different, different uh, parts of one autism spectrum disorder is progressive. So you can see there is progression made in uh, psychiatry, psychology. And now we're also thinking in science about uh, what the cause is and that it, it looks like that uh, it indeed is, it has uh, a genetic cause. It's a genetic deficiency and that's what science tells us. So that has implications for treatment, that has uh, implications for helping people that uh, have problems uh, due to their uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, so that has all kinds of implications. While if you allow for a different method, if you allow for using the University of Google, as Jenny McCarthy once has said in an interview with Oprah Winfrey, she is one of the people that is very vocal that says that vaccines cause autism, which we have no evidence at all. But that's from the scientific tradition. If you say, well, any method goes, any tradition goes, then you also should use the method of finding whatever you like uh, on Google. And then you'll find people just making the bold claim without any empirical evidence that vaccines cause autism. And you'll find that 5G networks cause autism and uh, cancer and uh, whatever. Uh, you probably can't find uh, someone who claims that gnomes uh, cause autism, whatever. And it's just, if any method is allowed, then the consequence is that you should teach that in lectures for psychologists 
and people uh, and other people uh, that, that are going to deal with uh, persons with autism spectrum disorder uh, in order for them to have all the knowledge so again if you look at the consequences the consequences look immediately like criticism now let's um, make one thing sure so if you say voodoo should be or astrology should be part of um, your education as a psychologist fire album says well you should be allowed to um, uh, choose that right then many students I've seen in exams in uh, the last years interpret that as that uh, fire oven says that astrology and voodoo are science are also scientific and he's not doing that he says astrology voodoo magic are different methods of gaining knowledge than the scientific method that doesn't imply that they are scientific methods so make sure you don't make that mistake on your exams so that's why we back at epistemology and not at philosophy of science he's not saying voodoo is science he's saying voodoo is an unscientific method of gaining knowledge so he is no longer making the claim like the logical positivists and popper were making that science is the only method to gain knowledge let's go back to the second consequence which i basically already mentioned but let's see uh, what fire happened, uh, has to say uh, about it and what he has to say uh, what, what more he has to say about it. so the second consequence is there should be freedom of methodology in education so if you argue against op opposition uh, sorry oppression as fire Amt is doing if he wants to let everyone free in their thinking then he says we never and i think he's right there we never uh, chose in a democratic way for science in our education system he basically makes the claim, and I don't know whether he's right there, that the states make lecturers uh, present only the method of science at universities and other educational systems um, as the only method to gain knowledge. So he also wants to separate state from not only church, but from education. Um, and he says, of course you're allowed to do science if you want but you should also be allowed to study magic or if you're interested in how the weather works uh, Navajo rain dances where does rain come from well how does how is rain caused well uh, well they have a theory apparently uh, you should also be able to uh, learn the method of making rain uh, or how rain is caused uh, that they have and as a psychologist that would mean you have to be able to choose astrology for psychology for psychologists or for voodoo for psychologists and you can't do that so that's unfair that's unjust that's against the humanitarian uh, stance now one consequence thus is that you should be able to do to study magic at the university and we're not talking magic tricks and there are really interesting books these days about the psychology of magic tricks uh, so there's really an interesting part of that but we're talking about real magic here so putting spells on someone uh, to make someone ill or something like that um, make magic potions stuff like that and that is one of the radical consequences of course if any method is a method to gain knowledge then any method should be allowed to be taught at universities or other educational uh, institutions and believe it or not there actually was someone who got a bachelor degree at a university in California his name is Isaac Bonewitz and he's written a book indeed about real magic and to show you what his claim is 
uh, what one of his claims is because uh, the, the entire book is, is like that. Uh, he says, how can you make a broomstick fly? So this idea of witches being able to fly on broomsticks, the stereotypical, stereotypical view we have on these non-existent persons uh, and their capacities is that they can, uh, how can you make a broom fly? Well, uh, you use the law of similarity. W what can fly? Birds can fly. So you make, you have to make the broom more like a bird. So what do you do? You put bird feathers on it, wave it around, chirp over it and so forth. This should be taught at university. This is someone who gets a, who has gotten a bachelor degree in magic, not a Penn and Teller magic, not a Houdini magic, but real magic, the magic of witches from fairy tales. Fairy tales are also a method of getting knowledge about the world, of course, if Fire Island is right. So you see that these consequences, well, they are so strange. I think Lactus is right. Lactus, when he said at that party, as reported by uh, Fire Island, and I used uh, that quote in the, in the beginning of this lecture, he had really strange ideas. And well, let's think about them, because many people do believe that astrology is a way to gain knowledge, that, uh, uh, that there is something to esoterical theories um, uh, that are uh, referring to witches and angels and uh, white magic and what you have. There, there are shops in every uh, every town where you can books you can buy books about that and magic stones, uh, whatever. Um, so there are people that actually believe this. So it is interesting that there is uh, an old academic a way of thinking of constructivism and relativism that's in support of that. But you also see, I think, that the consequences are so radical and so strange. Lacatus is right, he has such strange ideas as Paul Feyerabend, and I think he's more consequent than, uh, he's more honest than uh, Kuhn. Kuhn. Kuhn makes it really easy, he's just talking about, about science and not even that, he's only talking about physics and um, astronomy. If you really push things, if you really push constructivism and relativism, I think you'll end up with the theory of Fire Island. And that's radical. That's strange. Strange to the, um, uh, to, 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 to the amount that uh, if you if you push all uh, if you push it all and, and, and make and, and specify the implications, it it already is criticism. You can say you, you really do you really believe this, Paul Feyerabend, that you should study magic at a university, and and someone actually did that, and then you see what the response was. There's just one person, this Isaac Bonewit, that has a degree in magic from this university because immediately after it got known. That was put a stop to that. People put a stop to that. No, no, you, you can't no longer get a bachelor degree in magic at our university. And uh, I'm not aware if there is any university where you can do that. There's no university, I believe, where you can study astrology for psychologists. And there's a reason for that. And that is because relativism and constructivism is really problematic. Once you push it, push it, if you push it to the limits, then you get these consequences. And the question is, if we now look back at the arguments and the consequences of relativism and constructivism, is this really a tenable position? So let's look at some problems with it. Why isn't everyone a relativist and a constructivist? Let's evaluate relativism and constructivism. The first problem we discuss is one that pertains mostly to uh, Kuhn's view, because Kuhn says if you have two paradigms, you cannot rationally compare them, because people have different languages, speak different languages, they have different meanings 
uh, with their words, of their words. So he says two paradigms are incommensurable. But how can he say that? He says, well, in one paradigm, they use center of the universe to refer to Earth, and the other uses they use um, in the other paradigm they use center of uh, universe to refer to the sun. But if he can find that out, why can't the people in those two paradigms not find that out? So, oh, you're talking about the sun. Oh no, you were talking about Earth. Uh, okay, so now I'm talking about Earth. You're talking about the sun, and we have a disagreement uh, of whether. Uh, the sun or earth is the center of the universe. What's the problem? I don't see why um, uh, you, you could not do that as scientists. So apparently Kuhn is capable of making any paradigm his own because he writes as a historian, as a philosopher about the development of science and says, well, those people can't talk to each other. Well, you can, you're a historian, you're a scientist, you're a physicist, you're a scientist, you're able to do that. Why couldn't other do that? So if paradigms are as radically different as Kuhn claims they are, how is he able to do that? <laughs> so that, that's one problem. Uh, it seems that in practice, in, in writing about it, uh, he refutes his own statements, his own claims about uh, the incommensurability of paradigms. Which is related to the, the, the second problem, uh, is also kind of self-refuting uh, claim here, uh, because in the claim people make, everything is relative, uh, any sentence, any truth uh, or falsehood of a sentence is relative to uh, the constructed fact, uh, that is something that is that expresses relativism in general. Uh, truth depends on a paradigm, truth depends on a tradition. Uh, it contains a contradiction, it's self-refuting because it's a general claim that should be true in any tradition, in any uh, paradigm. And that means that there are truths that are not just relative to a paradigm or a tradition. So uh, this sometimes is seen as something uh, that's a bit of a kind of childish argument against it, but, uh, well, try to refute this argument uh, because it's a serious argument. And the third problem pertains more to um, uh, Fire Abend's view is anarchy. Should we really be able to choose courses in making rain by dancing at universities or astrology for psychologists? Uh, because if you really want to advance society, if you really want to help people, do you really need to know that, that people uh, that, that that someone is depressed because there's a spell put on him by someone, or that it's in the stars that it's just due to the planets of Saturn and Earth and the Sun being in one line that someone is depressed? Because then the treatment is quite simple: wait until Earth has moved, or the Sun has moved, or the Saturn has moved. And then the depression will go away. You should use that in your therapy if you become a clinical psychologist. So it looks like uh, Feyerabend is arguing that we should be able to choose our method because we never uh, had a vote which method we should use in, um, in uh, education. But it doesn't appear that this is up to voting. You're trying to find out what the world is like and it has nothing to do with voting for the method. It has to do with finding the method that provides you with falsifiable hypotheses about the world. You use them to predict something and then you'll see whether it's successful or not. And then you choose for the most, or then you then you not choose, you, you just accept that one method that does its work best. And that's the scientific method. If voodoo would be a better method than the scientific method, we would have voodoo at, at the university. So it has nothing to do with democracy or having people think the way they want. You want 
people to have the best method to acquire knowledge because you act upon your knowledge. And if you act as a psychologist on their knowledge that people are depressed because Saturn is in opposition to uh, the sun, well, you're not going to help people. You're not going to advance society. So should we indeed be able to choose for the scientific method or for another method? And then you say, well, science and democracy don't have that relation. It's not something we can vote for. What we want is we want to understand society. We want to understand the world. We want to improve the world. We want to find out what the world is like and have knowledge about the facts and use that knowledge to make predictions. And the scientific method is the best method to make those predictions. Take a look at something that's really relevant now. Where do we go? Where do we go to in order to find a vaccine or uh, a cure or uh, something uh, that helps us uh, uh, with this uh, COVID-19 problem? Well, we go to science. Why? Because medicine, scientific medicine, has shown in earlier cases that it helped. We got rid of many viruses using the scientific method. We didn't get rid of viruses using magic or voodoo or astrology. And that's why we use the scientific method. It's not a, a question of choosing your method and letting people free. Oh, you, you think uh, autism is, is caused by, uh, by vaccines. It isn't. If you think, you're nuts. And you're free to think that, but you're not free to act upon that. That's the problem. If you want to improve the world, we have to say in a democracy that people sometimes aren't allowed to do things. You're not allowed to say, well, I think any pe person that is uh, not religious should die. So here I am killing everyone, that's an atheist. N no, <laughs> that's, that's radical freedom, but that's not allowed in a democracy. And basically you're doing the same if you do not get uh, vaccinated, uh, you're killing those people that uh, are unable to uh, get vaccinated, for instance, or you're, you're running the risk of killing them. So, uh, and that's basically why we should not have uh, democracy we have we shouldn't vote for things that are best solved by science but using the scientific method science is not a democratic method if you ask america well depending on uh, who you ask which in which uh, area you ask but there are areas where you don't want the majority to determine what the facts are. Science doesn't work like that. We don't determine what the facts are. We find out what the facts are. And we could be mistaken. And sure, sure, uh, the observation is uh, theory laden, but maybe not as strong as the relativist and constructivist claim. So let's take a look at that because it all, bo all boils down to that argument. The observation is theory laden. If you have a different theory, then you have different observations, then you see different facts. The argument was based on drawings like this. You have a drawing you could interpret in two ways. So what you get as empirical data, what you get as input in your sensory system is the same whichever theory you uh, use to interpret those data. Those theories will all fit this picture. The theory that this is a duck fits the data and the theory that it's a rabbit fits the data. And then you say, oh yeah, but so, so that means that scientists in one paradigm see ducks and others see rabbits, not interpret the data as rabbits and interpret the data as uh, ducks, because that would imply that there is either a duck or a rabbit. So say there is a duck and you interpret rightly as a duck or wrongly as a rabbit. And you can't say that according to uh, people like uh, Kuhn and Feyerabend. So that was clearly what 
Kuhn was saying when he was talking about a duck and a rabbit. But if you look back to Jostrov, who used this, uh, the original picture, uh, he clearly said that observation is theory related, but your theory can be wrong. So there is an objective fact, and you, you need to uh, have an, uh, a theory to observe, to interpret the data. So take a look at, at your, your uh, brain scans in your book, and if you ask to point out the cerebellum and you point at uh, the hippocampus, uh, you're wrong. Your theory <laughs> makes you observe, well, the facts, you construct facts, in your subjective way, but your lecturer will uh, not count that argument, uh, your, your answer right on if that would be on an exam. So Jostrov also says, well, you have theory labels of observation, but that means that our objective facts we we see in a certain way, we interpret in a certain way. That's different from seeing the facts. So. This picture, or the original picture, was made in such a way that it should, it could have two interpretations. It was deliberate that it was either a duck or a rabbit. And then you use that picture from a, a funny magazine. It was a, it was a comic. It was meant to be to, to be funny. Oh, ducks and rabbits are so alike. Okay, uh, ha ha. Uh, really old. Uh, uh, magazine um, so but if you tell someone ducks can fly and uh, rabbits can't um, well then if you have something that you think well I don't know what it is it might be a duck it might be a rabbit just throw it out throw, throw it off a high building see what happens I think you're pretty sure you can let this animal go um, and you wouldn't do that with something you think of as a rabbit, because you know, you actually know, the rabbit can fly. And can you have a different theory again? Because your duck theory might be wrong, your rabbit theory might be wrong, this might actually be a giraffe. Because your observation is theory laden. If it's as radical as Kuhn and Firearm claim, you can't say that I am wrong if I say this is a picture of a giraffe. All I'm saying is, even though observation is theory laden, it's not that radical. You, and we can be wrong about the objective facts. This is a picture of a duck, not of a, a rabbit, not of a giraffe. No ambiguity here. So that means that the argument in favor of Relativism and constructivism is really a bad argument. And then all these implications do not follow. So then it might be a good idea to go back to our original question in uh, the philosophy of science part and say, well, maybe it's a good idea to see whether we can indeed not distinguish science from pseudoscience, whether we can, we can find a demarcation criterion uh, that actually does that because it looks like science is indeed the method that has the best track record in finding out what the objective facts are and then we should be able to make this distinction between science and pseudoscience because we do not want magic at the university we do not want voodoo at the university we do not want astrology for psychologists in uh, your education then we should have a demarcation criterion. And that is exactly what Emre Lakatos has done. Emre Lakatos was a very good friend of Paul Feyerabend, but he was not agreeing with him. He didn't think that anything goes. He thought that only science provided us with real knowledge. So let's look at his philosophy of science. Lagatus thus aims for finding a way to separate science from pseudoscience.
that's what he's trying to do. So he's trying to rescue the normativity of science. He's, he's trying to find a norm, something has to satisfy, has to adhere to in order to be classified as science. And that's what provides us with knowledge about the world. And that can be done by modifying Popper's falsificationism. So he says in falsificationism, so he, he defends a form of falsificationism. We went from dogmatic falsificationism. We haven't discussed that yet. So I'll say a couple of words about that in a moment. Then we went to methodological uh, falsificationism, which is the view of Popper. And now Lakatos is going to defend a more nuanced way of defending falsificationism, and that is sophisticated falsificationism. So Lakatos clearly sides with Popper, but he adjusts his falsificationism. So he says he's right in some way, but also kind of wrong. Uh, and we'll see what's wrong with the theory of Popper. And he says the same goes for Kuhn. Kuhn was also kind of right. So indeed, uh, scientists work with, well, holes. You call them paradigms. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I, in Lakatos, is not going. I'm not going to do that. But there is something to your ideas of paradigms. I think uh, Lakatos says that Kuhn has seen that right. So Popper's falsificationism clearly wasn't strong enough. Falsifiability as a demarcation criterion is too weak. It allows for all kinds of falsifiable claims from astrology to become part of um, science. You have to classify them as scientific statements. So it's not strong enough. So Lakatos has to make it stronger. That's what he's going to do. And he is he's finding help in the theory of Kuhn. But Kuhn denied progress when science changed, when we, had, when we changed from the, the, the geocentric paradigm to the heliocentric paradigm. He says that's not progress, it's not an improvement, it's not getting closer to the truth. And Lagardus would like to argue that it is, that there is progress in science, just like Popper would argue there is progress in science. So let's take a look at how uh, Lagardus sees that. So we go from dogmatic via methodological to sophisticated falsificationism. Dogmatic falsificationism was a theory uh, defended by Braithwaite and uh, it looks like falsificationism with uh, some assumptions of the logical positivists. And Lakatos calls this dogmatic falsificationism and the assumption of do dogmatic falsificationism was obviously that every scientific theory, every scientific statement is fallible. You could be wrong, so it should be falsifiable. But the empirical basis is infallible. That means you observe the objective facts the way the objective facts are. Basically something we also saw in logical positivism. The empirical basis is unproblematic. So you have this empirical data and then you judge a theory. You say, well, you have a claim about the world, you compare this claim to the facts, you observe, so you're doing what Wittgenstein says, what you should do, you should compare a sentence with a fact, and then you can establish whether it's true or not. Uh, and then if you say it's false, then you reject the theory based on the observed fact. Simple enough, clear enough, but uh, we have seen that uh, even though it's not as radical as the relativist and the constructivist claim, the observation is theory laden, so you should be careful there. There is no infallible empirical basis. You might be wrong. That's what we can learn from the theory ladenness of observation. You might have objective facts, but if you have a theory that interprets uh, uh, the, the, the the, the bark of a tree as a ghost, well, you have, you observe, you see, you, you think you see a ghost, but it isn't. So uh, you can't just compare any claim with the objective facts claiming that the uh, observation is theory, is, an, is not theory laden. So that makes it problematic because 
what could be the problem, of course, is that your theory you use to, to interpret these data is wrong. It might be right, but it also might be wrong. Uh, so we can't just do that. And if you take that into account, Lakater says, you get to Popper's methodological falsificationism that in some sense accepts the theory layers of observation. So we have seen that that was an argument against the logical positivist. So uh, it's also against this dogmatic falsificationism. And it's something that uh, Popper, uh, in some sense, uh, accepts. But uh, Popper also says, well, you can just accept this background theory, this theory you need to observe things. Uh, and that means that you still can gather empirical data and you compare that still to uh, a scientific theory. And a scientific theory then is not your background theory. It's not the theory you use to uh, uh, see what's there in the world. You need to observe the world. And therefore, Lacanus calls that the conventional empirical basis. He puts that between uh, quotation marks. It's a, it's, it's a convention. We, we just accept that if you look at uh, these animals and you say that's a swan, then we, uh, that, that is not problematic. You see a swan, and it is a swan. But then, if you know that you use an observation theory, if you use that background theory, you should not say that if you see a black swan and you have to use a theory to see that black to observe the black swan you just can flat out say that the scientific theory you're testing all swans are white and you test them with well, your observation and they are conflicting because the theory says all swans are white and here i see i observe a black swan but i do need a theory to to do to see that and we've seen that, right? So you, 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 need, you have this theory that tells you all these animals with wings and beaks and these long necks, etc., that swim uh, are swans. So you don't have that explicit, but you just that is the case. You could say, OK, the rejection of the scientific theory, all swans are white. You can't say, I know that it's false because that implies that you know that you actually have seen a black swan and that could, you could be wrong there. So what you should do <laughs> is say, I see that my observation conflicts with the scientific theory and therefore I reject, I refute the theory, um, but you can't claim that you know it's false because that would require more knowledge about uh, then you would be too certain about your background theory. So you don't say it's false, but you refute it anyway. Uh, so what you should do if you have this, uh, basically what the problem is, of course, if you have this deductive nomological model, this deductive way of reasoning, and that's what um, Popper argues we should use. You say all swans are white. This is a swan, hence it's white. If you don't see a black swan, you refute the first premise, the general claim, but also, you could also say, well, apparently this is not a swan. <laughs> so you have these two premises, and if you observe a black swan, then either that's not a swan, you're wrong there, or indeed, and that's what Popper usually does, you falsify the general claim. You say, not all swans are white. A falsification then is not the same as saying, I know that this is false, because you have to be careful with your background theory, with your, uh, with your theory that you use to observe this black. Lagarde says, that's all uh, very well, but it's not how it works. I'm not comparing a theory, a scientific theory to an observation, what I always do, and this he gets from Kuhn, what I always do is I compare two theories to what I think are the facts, and then I refute either of them, one of them. So it's not a two quarter fight between theory and experiment, or, or the observations of an experiment. It's theory versus theory versus the empirical basis. 
so what you observe. And see that if you if, if you say, oh yes, that, that's 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 what we are comparing. I'm not comparing the theory all swans are white to the observation, or the Earth is the center of the universe to the observation. I compare the Earth is the center of the universe versus the Sun is the universe is the center of the universe versus the observation of how the planets go, etc. etc. And then I decide which one is better. And see that here he refers back to Kuhn, not in terms of paradigms, he's not going to do that, but he says you have one theory, let's call it theory for the moment, and another, and then you compare that to the empirical basis, and then you see which one is best. So you so it's a fight between those two, if you put it in terms of fight, um, between those theories and, and what you think the facts are, which theory fits the facts best. You can only reject a paradigm in terms of Kuhn if there is an alternative. If you have no alternative, you keep on working with that paradigm in crisis. So you have this period of abnormal science and that's what Lakatos takes from Kuhn. You work with your theories and you can't refute them, you can't get rid of them unless you have a new set of theories, if you have a new theory. So it requires a second paradigm, it requires what uh, Imre Lakatos calls a research program. So if we look at theories, if we now look at sophisticated falsificationism, so that is the view that Lakatos defends, then what do we do? We reject an old theory and accept a new theory. We can't just reject an old theory and say, well, that's it, because then you don't have a theory anymore. So we, sophisticated falsificationist, a scientific theory, T, is falsified. So T is the old theory. If and only if another theory, T prime, has been proposed and it has to have certain properties. You just, you, you don't just say, well, here we have a theory uh, and I falsify this, I reject this, I no longer accept this for any new theory. So T prime has to have certain properties. And the first one is that it has excess empirical content over T. That is, it predicts novel facts. So it predicts facts that are improbable uh, or even forbidden by theory, so the, by the old theory. So let's take a look again at theories about the Earth and the, and the, and the Sun, etc. So t take t take the example that the Earth is a flat, a flat disk, and uh, the, that the Earth is a sphere. So what would the old theory that the Earth is flat predict? Well, if you start walking at point A and you keep on walking and walking, uh, and uh, using a boat even or something, but if you go in a straight line, in the end you'll drop off the face of the earth. That's a prediction. The new theory predicts if you start it, uh, at location A and you keep on going, you keep on going, well, the earth is round, you get back to A. That's a prediction that is not allowed by the old theory. So it's uh, it predicts a novel fact. It has excess empirical content. So that is the first property the new theory should have and that enables you to falsify the old one. Of course, and here you see the things the thing that it where he differs from Kuhn. Kuhn says well if you have this new paradigm then you basically got rid of the entire old paradigm and you start from scratch, you start anew. And that's very counterintuitive because we already saw there, for instance, that when we, go, when we went from the geocentric paradigm to the heliocentric paradigm, the assumption still was that planets move in circles. So apparently you didn't start from scratch. You used things from your old paradigm. So T, t, t prime has to explain the previous successes of T. So it, it builds on what you have and it changes things 
but there were things that were good of the old paradigm and you should keep them or if if the the predictions were uh, uh, successful uh, but based on false assumptions you should be able to explain why they were uh, successful after all so you should, you, you should keep the good things of TE and of course and then he looks uh, much uh, he, he looks uh, a little bit like uh, the logical positivists when do you change from t to t prime well t prime has to have uh, excess empirical content it should provide novel uh, predict novel facts and it should also be able to explain and keep all the good things from t but you're not just going to do that what you also is that it's corroborated that some of the predictions have been tested were not falsified so you have empirical evidence in favor of the new theory so you have to have some evidence before you go and reject the old theory in favor of the new one so you have to have predictions that are successful they're not proven you can't ever prove general claims you can't ever prove uh, theories that make general claims but you can corroborate them you can try to falsify them and fail at that and then you have empirical evidence in support and now empirical evidence becomes relevant in popper it was just corroboration it doesn't really say anything the next white swan you you see well it just says i failed at uh, falsifying the general claim all swans are white but in lakatosh empirical evidence in favor for t prime makes you indeed leave the old theory so that's important positive evidence so i hope you see that this is in some, somehow in accordance with kuhn's analysis of the history of uh, science and that it's meant as a normative alternative because it saves falsificationism, it saves falsifiability as a demarcation criterion. Uh, and of course, we already saw that, uh, well, Kuhn uh, thought he did not have a normative theory. Maybe Lakatos uh, accepts that. Uh, uh, but we already saw, of course, that Kuhn accidentally stumbled upon a demarcation criterion on a norm and that is having a paradigm. Okay, so Kuhn clearly has influenced Lakatos. In that, for instance, you need to have a new theory in order to be able to refute the old one, to leave the old paradigm. You have to have a new paradigm in, in Kuhn's terminology. So uh, he's influenced by Kuhn, but, but he doesn't accept that if you go from one paradigm to another, that that isn't progress. Lakatos also tries to defend progress in science. So how does Lakatos see scientific, uh, scientific change? The scientific change, according to Lakatos, is indeed progress. It's not a rift between two paradigms. And hence, he's not talking about paradigms. He doesn't use that term, because if you use the term paradigm, you basically buy into everything Kuhn uh, argued for. And Lakatos is not doing that. So he's basically saying, Popper was wrong, and I can improve his theory. Kuhn was wrong, and I can improve his theory. And by doing that, uh, we have this sophisticated falsificationism and that enables us to distinguish science from pseudoscience. Lakatos is talking about research programs and that looks like paradigms, but he doesn't use the word paradigm because then you buy into everything that uh, Kuhn uh, argued for and he is not doing that because uh, there are really big differences between research programs and paradigms. What is good is that scientists work with theoretical holes. So where Popper tries to falsify one claim or looks at one claim, whether it's falsifiable or not, like all swans are white, Kuhn says that's not how science work. Science work, scientists work with theoretical holes. He calls them paradigms. Lakatos says, I call them research programs. And there he, so there Lakatos goes along with Kuhn to some extent and says that Popper is wrong. Popper tries to establish whether a sentence in isolation is scientific or not. 
whether one sentence is falsifiable or not. And then you'll see that astrology contains all kinds of falsifiable claims, and those claims then belong to science. Lakatos is looking at entire research programs, as they call them. And then he has a different model of uh, how these sentences of uh, a theory are related. He has a kind of a model where it's kind of a network with a center, a core, a hard core. You don't touch, you don't refute, you don't uh, falsify those claims. And it's like a network where we have also sentences uh, that are at the edges of the network. So it's, it's different for, this is different from the, the model we saw in previous uh, lectures, like, like when we were talking about Descartes or the British Empiricists, where you have a foundation and then you build it up. So you have to start, you have to be absolutely sure about that, and then you build your knowledge uh, uh, on that. Here you have uh, a research program within uh, the center all kinds of statements, theories that coherently, uh, uh, that are coherent together and that you don't give up. So you want to stick to your research program at least to that. So if you're a biologist, you, so if, if you're looking at this sentence, all swans are white, you could argue, well, that's a sentence from biology. Uh, what happens if you falsify that? Do you give up biology? No, you don't. You don't say the theory of evolution by natural selection is false just because I observe one black swan. You don't say the theory of DNA uh, is falsified because I observed one black swan. What you say is, no, uh, apparently I was wrong about that claim that's uh, not in the center, not in the hardcore of uh, my research program. Uh, and if uh, uh, this, the claim all swans are white is falsified, well, that has no huge implications. So I was just wrong in the way I predicted the color of swans. I have to look at that again. We'll take a look at that, how that, how that works. So that's basically how Lakatos relates to Popper and Kuhn. Popper looked at sentences in isolation. Kuhn says no scientists work with theoretical holes with um, paradigms, and Kuhn says well it is about falsifiability, so that's that's correct in um, in what Popper said, uh, and what is good in uh, Kuhn's theory is that scientists indeed work with theoretical holes, but these theoretical holes can exist at the same time. That is, you can have different research programs, where in Kuhn you only have one paradigm that's accepted at one time. Of course, when there is a paradigm in crisis and there is a new paradigm, there is a little time where all the scientists go from one paradigm to the other. So there are actually two paradigms, but one is in crisis uh, and the other uh, is uh, slowly or fastly being being accepted. Uh, but in, 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 in Lakatos, you can have multiple research programs in the same domain uh, existing at the same time. And they are comparable, so they're not incommensurable. So where Kuhn says you can't compare them rationally, uh, scientists actually are doing that. If you belong to one research program and another scientist belongs to another one, you can debate and you try to find out which one is the best. So the incommensurability thesis is false. Scientists of different research program talk to each other, they try to find out who is right, and you'll say, well, here I have this experiment, and you do an experiment, and you might debate uh, methodologies. Uh, but in the end, you compare uh, your claims, you compare the research programs, and then one turns out to be better than the other. And then you'll say, well, then uh, I was wrong, and I'll accept your research program. And then you work together in that research program and to find out uh, more about the world. So, and that gives Lakatos the option to separate the research programs uh, in degenerative and progressive research programs. And you can use that using heuristics, and basically already mentioned it. So, a heuristic is a methodological way to find an answer to problems, and uh, it tells you uh, 
for instance, what you are not allowed to do, the negative heuristic, and what you should do, the positive heuristic. So take a look again at this at the sentence, uh, all swans are white. So take a look at biology. We'll, we'll apply it to um, psychology uh, at the end of this lecture. So take a look at this, this sentence that Popper constantly used, all swans are white. That has to be falsifiable in order to be classified as scientific. Okay, Lactose agrees with that, but he says, I'm not judging whether a sentence in isolation is scientific or not. I'm judging whether a research program is scientific or not. And what you do, and what you are not allowed to do, uh, depends on um, where the sentence in your research program is. So the negative heuristic tells you what you're not allowed to do. It's negative. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to reject the core, the hard core, the center of the research program. You're not allowed to do that. If you, because then you, as biologists, for instance, you would reject the theory of evolution by natural selection, and then basically you don't have a research program anymore. If all the evidence in the end shows that this theory is false, then of course you have to be honest and say, well, even the core, even the hard core of our research program has been falsified. And then you go to another research program. And this negative heuristic basically also implies the positive heuristic. Because if you're not allowed to falsify claims in the center of your uh, research program, you are allowed, of course, to falsify the claims uh, at the edges. And he calls that the protective belt. So you have the center and a protective belt. He also compares it to a farm with trees around it. So you have the farm. If you're a farmer, you don't want the uh, you don't want storms to. Uh, if you're in the open field, your farm's in the open field. You don't want uh, bad weather to destroy uh, your farm. So you put trees around it. And if the storms break one or three of two trees, who cares? It saves. Uh, the hardcore, it saves the, uh, uh, the farm, it saves in uh, science, it saves the uh, most trusted part of your research program. And so you don't falsify, so, so the claim all swans are white is somewhere in a protective belt, and it protects against the falsification of the hardcore of the research program, it, it protects uh, theory of evolution by natural selection from being falsified because you say, well, if if my prediction that all swans are white is being falsified, I have to change something in the protective belt. Basically, what I didn't do was take into account that at different locations on Earth, swans or the ancestors of the swans we have now evolved in a different way and apparently the swans in uh, Australia lived in isolation from the swans in Europe, uh, which makes sense because of the oceans uh, between them. And there they, de they became black and in Europe uh, swans uh, became white. Um, and we can explain that using the theory of evolution by natural selection. So we don't reject that theory, we only refute, falsify the claim that all swans are white, and you have to change, you have to make changes to your um, your protective belt, otherwise, well, you have a falsehood in your in your theory, in your research program, and you want to get rid of falsehoods, of course. The way you do that, of course, is by introducing other falsifiable claims. You, you're not allowed to use this immuni immunization strategy that you say or not. You don't say all swans are white or not, because then it's no longer falsifiable. And falsifiability is still key in Lakatos, sophisticated fals falsificationism, right? So it's clear that he takes that from Popper. Scientific claims have to be falsifiable, but scientific claims also are part of a research program. You don't just check individual claims, you check research programs for being scientific or not. And if there would be some research program that uh, has only unfalsifiable claims, it's not scientific. So now 
you can make this distinction between progressive and degenerative research programs. A progressive research program is one where when you adjust the, the protective belt, the theory becomes more complex, or the theories of the research program become more complex, and so you have excess empirical content. For instance, medicine. We now have all these hypotheses about how to tackle this COVID-19 problem. And we might say there are different hypotheses all using the core that says, well, it's a biological phenomenon, it's a virus, it has DNA, uh, and, and other, other claims like that. We don't mess with that. We don't say it's a spell put on someone. We don't say it's caused by 5G. Uh, we don't say it's caused by uh, whatever, gnomes, elves, uh, God, the devil, whatever. Uh, you use the research program of medicine, of biology, and you make predictions of this will happen when we do this and this and this, and then we have a vaccine, and this vaccine will work in this way. So we have all these predictions, and we have also already seen that there are different ways of trying to find a vaccine, and maybe most will not work. So these ways, the claims that it will work, that it works in that way, are falsified doesn't mean that you give up on the theory of evolution by natural selection and that uh, uh, viruses contain DNA and that we should tackle, try to tackle it uh, using that uh, theory. And when we find a vaccine, we know a little bit more. We have this empirical access, this empirical uh, access content, uh, access empirical content, and um, it's being corroborated. And then you have a progressive research program. A degenerative research program is one where you do the same. You have a research program. You don't touch the central claims. You tinker with the um, protective belt, uh, but tinkering with the protective belt doesn't doesn't work. So you make a prediction, and uh, the prediction is falsified. Your hypothesis is falsified. Then you change something, and you have a new hypothesis, a new prediction. And it's also falsified and it keeps on going like that then you say well i have to stick to it for the moment because i might not have a different research program but once there is a better a more progressive one you'll you'll uh, uh, have to change to that because it works better it's progressive so how can we distinguish between a scientific progress progressive research program and a pseudoscientific or degenerative or degenerating one. Well, the progressive program thus predicts more. And some of these predictions are successful. So it's falsifiable, it's coherent with the rest of the research program, so it's not just one single statement. And the prediction that's being generated by the research program is successful. It's not falsified, but it's corroborated. We have evidence supporting. It. And then you can also say that Marxism, uh, of course, Lakatos is just like Popper against that, uh, says Marxism never predicted a novel stunning fact, at least not successfully. All the predictions were falsified. Okay, so the idea is uh, you could say it's a research program, it makes predictions, but the predictions are all falsified. Well, that's a degenerative research program. So what you want is you want positive evidence and no refutation, or at least no constant refutations. So the occasional refutation, of course, is part of science, and then you, then you tinker, and you mess, and then you change the predictive belt in a way that uh, the entire research program, of course, still uh, remains uh, false. So now we can look again at astrology. The problem with this research program was that when we looked at falsifiability as a demarcation criterion, when we looked at Popper's falsificationism, then many sentences of astrology turned out to be falsifiable, and therefore they turned out to be scientific if falsifiability of claims is the only demarcation criterion. In Lagato's view, you don't just judge whether a single statement like all swans are white or you getting depressed because saturn is in line with earth and the sun 
you don't look at those individual claims, you look at the entire research program. And then you can say, well, all swans are white come from biology. Biology is a progressive research program. Astrology makes this claim that you get depressed because of the way of the planets are. Uh, and then it gets falsified. Someone is depressed and uh, Saturn is not in opposition to the sun. Um, so it's falsified. And what do you do? Your next claim is you're depressed because Saturn is in opposition of the sun. You, astrologers don't even bother with tinkering on, in a protective belt. They're not even doing, not even doing that. So that is pseudoscience. They stick to a degenerative research program no matter what. And now we can classify astrology as pseudoscience because it's if if you can talk if you can speak of a research program at all, it's degenerative. So if something is a real program, you make new predictions, right? To do research. It's a research program. It's a program for doing research. In psychology, you want to learn more about the human mind or the mind in general and then you 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 claim not to have all knowledge already so you you, you find out new things that's that's the goal of research so it well i, I use hiv here um because that i've been using that as an example for years but these days of course we have this this uh covid um covid19 uh, crisis where you say well it's it's a virus and if it's a virus, it has DNA. And if it is actually a virus, and we have seen how we uh, got rid of viruses in the past, well, that gives us a hypothesis or a set of hypotheses to come up with a way to fight this virus. It's a real program. It generates hypotheses of what to do, how to do research. Which, in which, which direction the research should go. If we have, didn't have a clue, you might as well, well drink bleach. That might work. It's not going to work. We have good reasons not even to try to bother with a stupid suggestion that we should inject or drink bleach. We know bleach is dangerous, so really, really. How stupid can people be? So, you need a real research program. And in astrology, you could even argue that it's not a real program because it doesn't propose things for research. They claim to have all knowledge already. You have this way, static, it's dogmatic, and this is how you uh, make uh, how you uh, make predictions about the future or how you uh, describe personality traits of someone who is born well, uh, in a period that you say, well, everyone born here is uh, Pisces or something like that. I don't know. Sagittarius. It's not a real program. Now, we should mention one thing. That is, there is a rational interval. That means you don't want to give up on a research program too fast. So if there is a research program that's new, it's trying to be progressive, so it's trying to do the right thing, so it's trying not to stick and, and, and not to um, falsify its core, uh, and it's tinkering with the protective belt, you should allow the research program to mature. You should allow it to find its way and uh, make uh, to become progressive. So, um, but in the end, you'll end up with, if you have more than one research program you'll, uh, within the same domain, you'll end up with one that's more progressive, that makes predictions that are falsifiable but are not falsified. So you, you, make one, you, you find one that's more successful. And then, well, go with that. But it's not dishonest to stick to a research program and try to make it progressive. But you actually have to do that, right? So what the astrologer does, disregard all falsifications 
and just stick to the research program, the degenerative research program, that's not something you're allowed to do. But you are allowed to try to turn a research program that looks like it might become degenerative or is degenerative into a progressive research program. You are allowed to do that. But, well, the question, of course, is how long are you allowed to do that? Once there is really a serious alternative research program that is actually progressive, you should go there. You should accept that and do research within that research program and use that to make predictions about the world. Larbush takes the idea of Kuhn's paradigms and turns them into research programs. So what did Kuhn think about that? Kuhn has read Lagatosh. What was his critique? What was his reaction? And the reaction was, he asked the question, is this a normative alternative? So Kuhn set out to describe science and the changes in science, the development in science, the revolutions in science. And then he says, Lakatos basically does the same. He uses uh, different terminology. So, uh, so he uses degenerative uh, uh, phase, for instance, and that looks very much like what I mean by crisis. That is, I say, a paradigm in crisis is a crisis where you have so many problems pertaining to, for instance, the predictions you make, your predictions are all falsified all the time, so you don't trust it anymore. A degenerative phase in a research program would also be something where you say, well, I make predictions and whatever I do, uh, tinkering with the protective belt, uh, my predictions are falsified. So that's basically the same. So it's not a normative alternative, it is a description of science just like mine is, and he just uses uh, different words, but basically it boils down to the same. Well, the question, of course, is whether that is true. So, Lakatos says it's not different, and the question then is, is it true? Does it really matter? Because Kuhn might say it's very similar to mine, it's not a norm normative alternative to my descriptive theory, but we have already seen that Kuhn's uh, descriptive theory actually was normative as well. He had found a demarcation criterion, and some used it. So we, in, in last lecture, we, we looked at uh, David Palermo, for instance. He said, well, yeah, um, psychology is a science because it did have a paradigm uh, already with introspectionism. And, and, well, we then got a history from that. So it is a science using Kuhn's demarcation criterion, even though Kuhn says, I didn't find a demarcation criterion. And now he says, Lakatos, you're saying the same as I did, and you don't have basically a normative alternative, but he could say, you might not like it, Thomas Kuhn, but your descriptive theory actually is a normative theory. And then whether Lakatos uh, came up with something new or not, well, that the question whether it's new or not is, is not really interesting. Lakatos clearly has a normative theory, and the question, of course, is whether uh, it is not uh, different after all, because if you look at Kuhn, Kuhn says paradigms can't exist together. You can only have one paradigm that has been accepted, while research programs, you might have different research programs at the same time, and they are, the scientists within these research programs are debating, and one of them will be the most uh, progressive, while the debate between scientists in different paradigms, at, at the moment there are, uh, there is a new paradigm when the old is in crisis, they can't talk to each other. So it seems one, Kuhn and Lakatos are not saying the same thing, and two, um, the fact that um, Kuhn's theory already was normative, uh, well, diffuses the argument uh, that uh, Lakatos uh, theory is not a normative alternative. It might be a normative alternative, uh, but both are normative, and that's the point.
Kuhn was trying to make. I'm not normative. Lakatos is not normative. Well, he was normative. Lakatos is clearly a normative, as, as a normative theory. Now, if we simplify it and make a checklist, then you could say Lakatos has several demarcation criteria. So not one criterion, but several demarcation criteria. The first, of course, is falsifiability. Claims, theories, research programs have to be falsifiable. Any claim that's unfalsifiable, any theory, any research program that makes use of unfalsifiable statements is unscientific. But we saw in Popper that that's not enough. And here we see that Lakatos adds to it that scientists work with a research program akin to the paradigms uh, of Kuhn, but slightly different, of course. If the research program, uh, if you want to classify it as scientific, it has to be progressive. It has to make predictions about the world that are not falsified, but are supported by empirical evidence. And that means that if that doesn't happen, you shouldn't cling to a, pro a research program that uh, makes all these falsifiable claims that are time and again falsified. You're allowed to do this for a, to time being, but in the end, when a more pre a progressive research program is there, you, you should accept that. So you should, you should, you are allowed, of course, to turn a degenerative research program again into a progressive research program, but. Uh, when all attempts fail, then you should uh, uh, go to the most, the more progressive research program. So what does this imply for psychology? Just like with Kuhn's demarcation criterion, that's not uh, totally clear uh, for a similar reason, because what's the research program of psychology? And again, my suggestions would be, is evolutionary psychology that? Is materialism? Uh, part of uh, all the uh, different parts of psychology. So is that in uh, the core of the research program of psychology in general? Uh, well, uh, we could think about that, uh, but it's, it's, it's not definitely clear. It's not something that uh, has been spelled out, I think. Uh, what you can see here, is uh, in, in psychology. I, th I think we would like to claim scientific status for uh, uh, psychology, but we have this replication crisis where it's hard to uh, uh, reproduce uh, similar results of previous uh, experiments. So we already talked about why that's the case. And here you could say, well, what you're trying to do uh, when you do replication research is you try to find out which methods work, which experiments were correct, and which hypothesis you might give up because there was confirmation bias or publication bias involved. Um, and you should, in the end, reject and say, well, uh, we thought we had positive evidence in favor for a certain hypothesis, but after all, we didn't. So that looks like uh, that you're uh, tinkering with the uh, protective belt and that you're trying to make your, re your, your, your research program as progressive as possible, having noticed that there are problems with it. So it runs the risk of becoming a degenerative research program. And as long as you do it like this, you're allowed to do that. So that's actually uh, a sign of scientific thinking, accepting that um, your hypotheses that are being falsified um, require you to do something. That's what the positive heuristic says. You have to you have to tinker with the protective belt. It could turn out, of course, in the end, that some programs uh, have so many problems that you should have, you should take a different approach. You should leave the research program in favor for a more progressive one. Maybe the problems in social psychology with this replication crisis is really uh, obvious. Uh, maybe that uh, 
should be replaced by a new research program in social, social psychology. We'll have to wait and see what happens. We can conclude that we do have a set of demarcation criteria. It works. Okay, so in these last two lectures, we have looked at constructivism and relativism, two important views that go together in philosophy of science and epistemology. We have seen what the argument in favor of it is, and that is that the observation is theory laden, and that that is, in the end, a problematic argument. But historically it's seen, Kuhn and Farhan did have a lot of influence in the debate about science and knowledge, in thinking about science and knowledge. But we have good reasons to understand uh, uh, why not everybody is a relativist and a constructivist, and why uh, there is no such thing as astrology for psychologists in uh, uh, your program, for instance. And with the latest attempt of Lakatos to distinguish science from pseudoscience, which builds on uh, ideas both of Karl Popper and uh, Thomas Kuhn, we can see that we can actually succeed in explaining what makes the difference between science and non-science and that we can understand why astrology indeed is not a science and that if you claim scientific status for that, if you say astrology is scientific, then you're a pseudoscientist. And we thus also understand why there is no astrology for psychology in your programs using the different demarcation criteria of Lakatos. There are more uh, demarcation criteria, uh, but that would be something for a different course. Uh, the thing was that Kuhn argues that it's not a normative alternative, but we already saw in the lecture about Kuhn that even though Kuhn claimed it was merely a descriptive theory of uh, the development of science, it clearly was interpreted uh, by many as uh, normative as well. Uh, having a paradigm was uh, the norm uh, Kuhn accidentally found. So now we have a way to distinguish science from pseudoscience. What is left to think about? Well, next time we'll see that we are again thinking about skepticism, empiricism, but in a slightly different, of course, contemporary context. We will take a look at uh, scientific realism, and that is a view that uh, I think is interesting for psychologists because it argues that we can have knowledge about things we cannot observe, usually Scientific realists are talking about atoms and molecules, but it also applies, of course, to mental states we can't observe, the mental states of other human beings. So it is interesting, I think, to look at that uh, for a psychologist. Uh, the scientific realist is in debate with a constructive empiricist. That is an empiricist that's also a constructivist, but we have seen today that radical constructivism uh, will not uh, do very well. Uh, has all these problems, but uh, it pertains to the domains of the world we cannot observe with our own senses. So we'll take a look at that and see whether there is any um, merit to being a constructive empiricist and what the relevance then is for psychology. Pragmatism and naturalism both are views that are closely related. They are uh, both arguing that if you want to solve a problem, if you want to answer a question, you have to use the scientific method. And both are able to address the problem of the skeptics in some way, because we started off by thinking about knowledge, thinking about how we justify our beliefs. And then we have seen along the way 
and we also saw that today with uh, Lakatos, that scientific claims are always falsifiable and you always run the risk that they are being falsified. So you can never say you're absolutely sure. So that seems to imply that knowledge as justified and true beliefs cannot be achieved because you can never justify your beliefs. And that results in the question, is the skeptic right after all? And the pragmatist and the naturalist have a way of tackling this problem, answering this question without making a claim that we can actually justify our beliefs. So we'll see how this goes, how that goes in next lecture. So finally, let's look at an old exam question. The question is about research programs. So it's about Imre Lakatos. According to the positive heuristic, what should scientists do? Well, basically the idea is that if you have a research program, you have a core, a hard core in the middle, you have a protective belt around that. It protects the research program, the core of the research program against false falsification. So what do you do when there is a falsification of a hypothesis that generated that generated by your research program? Well, you change something of the protective belt. You don't give up the core. You don't give up the research program. So answer A, change the protective belt of a research program as soon as an observation occurs that's incompatible with the theory. Well, that is correct. So let's take a look at uh, B, C, and D, they should be incorrect. Change the hard core of a research program as soon as an observation occurs that's incoherent with the theory. Well, you don't do that. You make a change to the uh, protective belt. You say, well, the way we generated our hypothesis was incorrect or something like that. You don't give up on your core theories. Leave a research program as soon as it is established that another research program is incompatible with. No, no need to do that. You just find out which research program is the most progressive and you accept that. Uh, leave a research program as soon as it is established that another research program is incommensurable, incommensurable with it. Well, that's a term, of course, by uh, Kuhn. That's not something that Lakatos would say. So indeed, A is the only correct answer. That's it for lecture seven. Stay safe.